Good evening. Call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't believe our invocator is here. I don't see him. So if you will all join me in a moment of silence. Okay. Thank you. And I'll have a seat. Start with a roll call list. Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Vice Mayor Brown. Here. Council Member Leger. Here. Council Member Tolis. Here. Council Member Deporter. Here. Council Member Magazine. Okay, we'll go on with our first presentation a plaque from Texas AM, donation of ladder truck to the Port Aransas Volunteer Fire Department. Grady? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, you'll probably recall that uh, a year ago, um, Hurricane Harvey uh, hit the, um, the region of the um, uh, Gulf of Mexico and really devastated parts of Texas. Um, this particular area on um, uh, Port Aransas um, was totally devastated. They lost uh, quite a bit of their rolling stock um, in the fire department. Um, through the Texas A&M uh, donation program, um, the town, we just recently um, were about to receive um, our new vehicle, our new uh, fire truck, and so we donated this ladder truck um, this past spring. Actually, it was probably closer to June. I'm going to go ahead and have the uh, fire chief uh, come up and say a few words, and we received um, a plaque in recognition of that donation recently. Fire chief. Madam Mayor and Council, on behalf of uh, Texas A&M Forestry Division and the Port Aransas Fire Department, they are giving us this plaque of uh, certificate of appreciation. They took delivery of the fire truck at the end of March of this year, and it has greatly helped them be able to, to help rebuild, start that process. Uh, they're a small community of about 3,500 people, which um, just grows exponentially with, with the tourism that they have as part of being on the coast. and your gracious donation and with the help of uh, uh, Public Works Director, Mr. Weldy, uh, they are well on the road to recovery and, and thanks to everything that uh, they did, they're greatly appreciative of all our help for them. So uh, here's a plaque for you. Okay, let me come down there and accept this. <clears throat> Okay, next we have an update by our Cox representative, Julia Young. Mayor and Council, thank you so much for having us. See if I can figure out. This is the fanciest thing I've I've got to do all day. So, <laughs> all right. Let's see. Um, Need some help? We can help you with that. Justin, step up there now. <laughs> nope, there it is. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so every so often we like to get around uh, to all of our towns and cities and just provide an update on what Cox is up to these days, um, which is, is quite a lot more than, um, than you might think. Um, one thing we also want to uh, sort of start off with uh, that people don't know is that um, you know, we've been serving uh, Fountain Hills and, and um, surrounding areas for, for about 20 years now. Um, and we employ more than 3,200 uh, uh, residents in Arizona right now. We're still a family-owned company. Um, a lot of folks are surprised to hear that. We went, uh, we went public, I think, for a hot minute many years ago when we uh, launched telephone service. But uh, that was uh, the company bought those shares back, and we, we continue to be a family-owned business today. Um, oh, let me, uh, there we are, okay. So, um, can, you know, we can make that full screen for you. Oh, okay. Liz will help you out with Is that. Is that, I wasn't sure that I was controlling that. You can see that better. <laughs> Oh, That's not here. What I, <laughs> I think it's um, slideshow on the top. On the top slideshow. Slide Current slide. There we are. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. There we go. So. Um, I've been working for Cox for about 20 years. I was around when we first launched internet service um, in 2001. It was, uh, it was not what we have today. It's about a thousand times faster than it was 20 years ago. Um, we also enable about 15,000 Wi-Fi hotspots across our footprint. And we very proudly offer a low-cost internet program uh, to eligible families. Um, I have a slide on that in a little bit. And there's some information in the packets that we've provided to all of you. For community involvement, we really are so big um, about encouraging our employees to you know, tap into their passions and, and find a way to give back to their communities. Um, our employees, on average, volunteer more than 35,000 hours every year. Um, on top of that, our community investment, uh, Cox Charities supports the Valley's nonprofits to the tune of about $25.7 million per year. And that is uh, both with in-kind and cash services. Um, our, gener our operations generate $110 million in state and county and local taxes, which of course goes to infrastructure and, and roads and all the things that keep our towns and cities uh, moving. And overall, Cox represents about $3 billion of Arizona's economy um, every year. So the family is continuing to place their bets on um, Arizona's success, on Cox's success in Arizona, and is doing so by investing another billion dollars over the next um, year, or I'm sorry, over into our network over the next five years, um, and even more over the next 10. Oh, there's that new slide we created. <laughs> um, so we have a network transformation that is completely underway, and I checked with our folks, and I am, I'm happy to report that uh, Fountain Hills is 100% gig enabled. So if you are interested in having gig speeds either you know, in your homes, we've been offering that on the business side for quite some time. Um, but if you're interested in having gig speeds at your home, um, this is available throughout um, our footprint in, uh, in Fountain Hills. Um, you just need the right modem to achieve those speeds, and that's a 3.1 modem. We're really getting involved in smart cities, uh, smart regions. Um, that billion dollar investment that I talked about earlier from the Cox family, um, is, is really here to, to sort of build the wave of the future. Um, with an extensive network and infrastructure, we can help cities and, and towns identify um, really some amazing cost-saving solutions. Um, that smart technology allows users to get really smart with energy, the buildings, education, healthcare, 
infrastructure, transport, security, and a host of other things that we probably haven't even thought of yet. And we're really looking to towns and cities like yours to come to us with, with the things that you're looking to improve because we really believe we have some solutions that we can offer. So we have um, a couple of other surprises that folks don't always think about. Um, we're really in the automotive um, business. Uh, we own Cox Communications owns, um, or the Cox family owns Kelly Blue Book, um, the Auto Trader, as well as Mannheim Auto Auctions, which has a very big um, operation right here in Arizona. Um, and it's through some of that, those automotive uh, folks that we came by this um, a lot of the smart uh, technologies that, that we're talking about deploying, um, we call it Cox 2M, and uh, it is, it's helping us bring uh, fleet vehicles through our auto auctions in a much more efficient pace because uh, the dealers bring those, those autos to us, um, we help auction them off, and the more we can push through, the more money everybody makes. And uh, so um, our partners um, who are investing with Mannheim are very, they're very excited about those technologies, and those are the same technologies that we hope to bring to towns and cities. We're also involved in small cell deployment. So we're not a, a mobile provider. You know, we're, we don't often offer the same services that, say, uh, Verizon or T-Mobile have. But we are deploying their small cell devices on their behalf because we, we can simply do that um, uh, more efficiently than they can. We understand the permit process. We've got the licensing. And so we partner with Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T to, uh, to put up their small cell devices. Um, again, this is all part of the smart city network. Um, and if you don't notice them, you know, they used to be a bit more of an eyesore, but you don't really notice them anymore because of the great partnerships that we've developed with towns and cities. It's your staff that we work with, and, and now you, you hardly notice them up there. And that's really due to all the great collaboration that we have with all of our stakeholders. We also offer now home automation. So a few years ago, we started offering home security services, so about six years ago. And what we realized um, shortly after launching is that, yeah, a lot of people like that, but what they really love is just being able to automate their homes. So whether it's their thermostats or whether they just want to figure out how Fido gets on the counter and gets those cookies every time they leave the room, um, you know, they just, they, they're really hungry for that home automation. And sometimes they don't want the security that the third party monitoring just isn't as interesting to them. Um, so we have offered um, home automation. We've been doing this for about a year. Um, it's at a much lower cost than uh, the security service. Our home automation product allows customers to set all kinds of alerts. Sorry, that's, that's okay. my Cox alarm going off. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's Sorry. fabulous. <laughs> Paid advertising. Sorry. <laughs> My we, husband must have set the alarm off. We couldn't have timed that better, Mayor. I apologize. <laughs> you guys worked that out. Right? That seems rehearsed to me. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so it, it does, it works on your phone, you know, it'll send you alerts and let you know, you know, when somebody yeah. walks through the door or disarms the, uh, or sets it off. Sets it off, yeah. <laughs> um, lets you know when Susie gets home from school or um, you can automatically turn on lights, you can change the temperature, and best of all, uh, we can set it up for you. So that's what kind of sets us apart from our competitors is we come out and uh, we, can, we can design it for you, we can install all of it for you, and we can help you set up all those alerts that really make this service useful for you. Um, you'll get a free starter kit that's worth $300, $350. There's no contract. Um, we set it up for a low cost, and I believe it's only about $20 a month. So it's a great deal. So here are some of the devices that make it work. Um, 
You've got your HD cameras, your sensors, uh, the home, several home automation devices, including um, a, a door lock that works with, um, it can work with a key, but you can just punch in different codes and let in a number of people like, like I don't know, like your electrician or maybe your cable guy. <laughs> no, we, we require somebody to be home at all times when we're there, don't worry. So um, another thing we're getting involved in is telemedicine. So we've, we've been actually investing in this area since 2015. Um, it is another area of smart cities, smart regions. It's a smart way to provide quality, affordable health care to people. Um, um, especially in those underserved and remote populations, uh, the remote patient monitoring uh, can do a number of things, including mitigate rising health care costs, mitigate provider shortages. Um, this is really about allowing more people, whether they're uh, seniors or just vulnerable citizens, it allows more people to live at home longer, more confidently, and stay in touch with their physicians. Um, we think it's going to uh, really be a game changer and provide families who have folks like this, like my folks are in California, and I, I, I hope I can, I hope they get talk technology like this because I would feel a whole lot better about them. Um, so we do think this is a game changer. We hope it really improves everybody's lives, and we look forward to investing even deeper into this particular area. So here's a slide about Mannheim Auto. I won't spend a lot of time here because we already talked about it, but uh, we've got Ready Logistics. Uh, Mannheim is, is up and operating um, in Phoenix and in Tucson, um, as well as other states as well. So this past year, we did pass some, uh, some legislation, uh, Senate Bill 1140. Um, I think the, the most, uh, the, the best thing about this uh, legislation is that it allows towns and cities to retain their ability to collect 5% um, in license fees and to main, maintain control of the right-of-way. These were the most contentious areas and we were really happy that in the end um, this was the outcome. Um, and of course, it just allows Cox to continue to innovate in a very competitive marketplace. You know, we're, we're not the only providers of programming these days. Um, you know, when I first came to Cox, we were only a cable company. Of course, we offer other services now, but now you can get programming through Amazon and Hulu and, and Roku and just so many other places. So we truly are facing a lot of competition and license and uh, legislation like this really does allow us to remain a bit more nimble. So here's one of my favorite slides and this is the one that I talked about um, earlier on. This is about closing the digital divide and helping um, helping more families get access to high-speed data, um, folks that might not otherwise be able to afford it. So in your packets, you have a flyer. It's two-sided. It's um, in Spanish on one side, English on the other. Um, and this is a program called Connect to Compete. So Cox has partnered with a nationwide program called Everyone On, and their goal is to get more people access to high-speed internet. Um, we do this by uh, families with at least one student, grades K through 12, living in the household, will qualify for high-speed internet service for only $9.95 a month. That's no contract, no deposit, free modem, free installation. Um, there are some eligibility requirements, but what we have found is we are just barely scratching the surface of the students that we can reach with this program. Um, so we've been doing it since about 2014. We've helped over 70,000 individuals get access to high-speed internet through this program. Um, we are constantly partnering with schools and communities and nonprofits to find more opportunities to deliver this. We know that a lot of you are working with nonprofits yourselves. All of you are, are into um, phil philanthropic um, things outside of your roles as in, on the council. And so we welcome you to share this information out in the world because, again, we're always looking for more folks to help us get the word out about this program. Um, we partner with folks like um, Valley Metro and other folks to find, um, to get 
uh, refurbished laptops and desktop computers that we will put on these programs and invite the families in, get them set up, and sometimes set, send them home with the first computer they've ever had. Um, so again, we're looking for those partnerships. Um, we see families, it is a big lift for the entire family because it's not just about the student doing well in school, it's about the entire family being able to access a number of opportunities, um, whether it's job applications, uh, continuing education, um, a host of other things. So this is great for the family, great for the community, and we're really proud to be a part of it. So uh, for those folks that, um, that might not qualify or may not be in our footprint, uh, they can still go to one of our Cox Technology Centers and, and access um, uh, internet service and other technology programs. Um, it's providing a safe technology place for the community and I'm happy to report that we have one of these right in Fountain Hills. It's the Mary Ellen and Robert McKee branch. It's the Boy and, Boys and Girls Club of Greater Scottsdale located at 14605 North Dell Cambrai Avenue right here in Fountain Hills. So um, we have laptops there. We've got a number of various programs that help uh, students as well as other members of the family um, become uh, computer literate. And so, I, you know, I, I'm not quite sure how far that is from here, but I don't think it's, it's not very... far at all. I, we all know where it is. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> probably drive by it on yeah. my way out. So. All right, well that just about wraps it up for me, um, except to just say that you know we, we're super involved in the community. Um, our, biggest, uh, our, our biggest focus really is kids and education, so we're very involved in STEM. These are just a, a few of the folks that, that we partner with and provide grants to. Um, but we're always looking for more opportunities. If there's, a, if there's an event or a place you think that Cox should be involved in, definitely give me a call. My card is in your packet. We want to hear from you. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right. Well, first, I want to thank you for coming out and doing this presentation for us. It's always great to hear about the new innovations and what you have going on out there because we get those kind of questions from our residents. I do have one question, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this. You know you have um, 15,000 hotspots around. Uh, any plan for Fountain Hills? You know, um, that is a great question. I should look into that and find out just how close mm -hmm. they are. I don't know if we have any of them in Fountain Hills or how close they are to Fountain Hills, but I'd be happy to follow up and provide that information. Okay, we would love to have one in our downtown area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was fantastic. Uh, along the line of just two quick questions, small cell deployment, are you, you're working with people on our staff already about that. One of our issues, as you know, is no, we don't have light poles uh, and we don't have things to attach stuff to, so we have to be extra creative uh, in a lot of cases. So uh, it's good that your group is working uh, with them so that we can come up with a reasonable solution. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, that was just a comment, I guess. No. <laughs> and then the final thing is just, I think it's great, the, uh, the low-cost internet. I mean, access to internet is, in today's society, kind of an imperative to workforce, education, success, kind of across the board. Uh, so it's great you have that program. Do you know if you're working with our school district or the fort next door, just as far as exposure of the programs? And if there's anything we do to help you connect, yeah. just awareness. Um, I would love to chat with you. Um, uh, later this week, um, I'll reach out to you and, and find out if we can work with them, absolutely. Um, we have Roxanne Wingate from our community relations group. She really takes the lead um, for that program here in Arizona, um, and I'm happy to connect you with her, and we'll find out if those relationships already exist or what we can do to further them. Because I think, contrary to sometimes popular belief, there is, there is a lot of there's need here uh, in our district, and I think this would be uh, a tremendous value add so thanks for coming all right questions councilman um, just a comment thank you for your update it's it's been it's been some time i think since we've had such a comprehensive update um and um very comprehensive presentation <clears throat> and just kind of as a side note um you learn something all the time when people come before us and this is kind of trivial but uh i i was not aware that cox was a family business right. that's uh, it's quite interesting Right. We're, we're proud of that. Yeah. We're not beholden to stakeholders. Absolutely. So. Thanks for your presentation. We're beholden to our employees and our customers. <laughs> your customers, I hope, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Anything else? Any other questions or comments from Council? Okay, if not, thank you very much. And it's good that my alarm system works, so sorry <laughs> it went off in the middle of, of your presentation. That was great. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. All right, we will go on now to call to the public. Do we have any? Okay. Remind uh, anyone who comes up to call to the public and anybody is here that is anybody can come up and say anything they want, uh, hopefully within reason. And they have three minutes, and by law we can't comment on what they say, but we give them three minutes to say whatever they want to say. First? First is Judy Bichel. Bichel? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Bichel? Bichel. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Hey, Judy. Um, most of you know me from the American Legion, but I also belong to the 40 and 8, which is an honor society of veterans. And I'm here tonight with uh, Len Zaw, John Schwab, and Chuck Lewis, who are also dual members of both organizations. And uh, earlier this spring, I presented the Town of Fountain Hills as the Town of the Year for our organization. And we were accepted and received the award and so I would love to get a picture with Mayor Kavanaugh and present her with our plaque. Oh, can you, you want to explain to everyone a little something about what it is? Um, the 40 and 8 is a, uh, it's a veteran service organization. It's actually an honor society of the American Legion. They do a lot of uh, organ, uh, voluntary service and uh, some of their main charities are like, um, we support nurses training put a lot of nurses through schooling, um, and they also do uh, the flags for first graders and programs like that. So they pretty much promote patriotism, and it's, it's the fun end of the organization of the American Legion. They just raise money and have a good time, so. Awesome, okay, thanks, sure. Um, okay, come down for a picture, guys, come on up. Certainly so many things that makes our town so special, and American Legion is one of them. Thank you so much. And next. Next is Pam Aguilou. Ag I'm not sure. Pamela. Okay. <laughs> I'm Pam Trumpeter Agalu. I live in Fountain Hills and have lived in Fountain Hills for seven years, and I am actually an Arizona native as well. Um, I am here tonight for a very simple reason. Uh, we just had an election. We elected a new mayor, and uh, we have an opportunity now to follow through with that election in the uh, way of, of your process to uh, let us know who you think the next town councilman should be. And the common sense approach to me is with the election, with people having spoken, and with two of the candidates, they were in it from the beginning, they worked hard, they had supporters, they also garnered enough uh, votes to be pretty much viable candidates. And it seems to me that instead of wasting, 
it's not a waste, but instead of using the time and resources of the town to try and find our next uh, appointed town council member, we should go back to that election. There are two candidates, choose from those two. The people spoke, the people said, we're interested in these candidates. Each one of them got enough votes to, to really think about. Um, I, I think that everybody else that has applied for the position are well qualified, they're good people. Many of them I like, <laughs> but I do think, I think to honor the people of Fountain Hills and honor the votes that they placed, the petitions that they signed, the, the signage that they put in their yards during the election. You know, I, I think it, it, it's kind of a common sense type of thing. If this had been a case where somebody was, had to leave the council for personal reasons or there was a death or illness, that's a different situation, but we do have an opportunity to honor an election that just was finished up and say to our, our town, yes, your votes do count. They still count. So I would like to suggest to you that you might take a look at that, think about what's best for our community, spending time on studies and committee meetings and all the rest of that, that costs money and it costs time. And I know that there's probably a, a process that's already been thought of, but please think about what's best for our community, what's the fiscal responsibility of our community, and a common sense approach. That's it. Okay, thank you. Next. Cindy Perrin. Good evening, Mayor, Town Council, staff, and people from Fountain Hills. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'll take a couple minutes of your time. I'm here to speak about the same subject as the previous person, and I agree with them. We have two great people who, are, uh, who ran in the last election, and their name is up there, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Jerry Fredell. Uh, he ran, and he worked hard. Jerry Fredell is an honest and transparent man. He uh, personally met and spoke with hundreds of residents of Fountain Hills during his run for council. He listened to their concerns and ideas for Fountain Hills. Jerry took notes and is dedicated to the voice of the people being heard. Jerry knocked on over 2,000 doors during the hottest days of summer when temperatures were well over 195 degrees. Just kidding. They were well over 100 degrees. Felt like that. I just want to make sure everybody's listening. <laughs> that alone shows his dedication to the residents of our town. Jerry will always listen to us, the residents, and make educated decisions based on the will of the people, not personal choice. These qualifications set Jerry apart from the others expressing an interest in this vacated seat. Jerry has 39 years of financial experience. Jerry earned a BA in bank management finance from North Central College and has a certificate in financing and financial planning from Loyola Business School. Jerry and his wife Barbara have been Fountain Hills property owners for 28 years, understand the financial, safety, and infrastructure issues facing our town. Jerry is a team player and will work well with others on the Council for the Betterment of Fountain Hills. We, the residents of Fountain Hills, support his appointment to the vacated seat with 263 signatures collected on behalf of Jerry Friedel. And I have here all the signatures. And we also did a online petition, and I have some of those comments that people uh, did made here. Uh, they like his experience and his views. We need his experience and counsel that will listen. We need Jerry Friedel on the Fountain Hills City Council. Uh, John P. says, because I, no, I'm sorry, Mark C., fiscal sanity in Fountain Hills is what we need. Claire L. says, we need to have Jerry Friedel focused on our financial, on our finances and the town budget to help us get out of this ditch. 
Kathy sees his financial residence with a strong financial background. There's a, uh, no better combination. Stephen says Jerry has an excellent skills and balanced approach and strong financial mind. Steve C. says Jerry Friedel has what it takes to start through the mess and help us to make our town to, I'm sorry, to make sense of our town budget. It's time for change because we deserve better and he's the right choice. I would like to thank you for your time and consideration and God bless. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Anybody else? I'm sorry, I can't read it very well. Gus? Someone? Marcus? Marcus. Yeah, I can't read this at all. Yeah. Good evening, Hi, Marcus. Kavanaugh and distinguished mm -hmm. council members. Um, my name is Marcus Fielo von Denowitz. Uh, I was a candidate for town council. I came in last. Um, my comments this evening will oscillate around the decision you're going to have to make regarding the appointment to the vacant seat for town council. Um, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of qualified applicants from qualified citizens to factor. However, as someone who took the risk to enter the public debate and provide ideas on how to improve our town, I'm really urging you to consider both Jerry and Sharon. It's not easy putting yourself out there to endure criticism and run a campaign, as I know most of you know. Jerry and Sharon took that time to share their ideas, fundraise, and respond to people who didn't always agree with them. That alone distinguishes them. And that alone, in my opinion, qualifies them. With that said, I'd like to lobby for Jerry. I obviously got to know him well, and I wanted to know, let you know a little bit about him more and why I think he'd be an excellent choice to fill the vacancy. So personally, I know Jerry, and I would define him very much as a team player. I would have never made the ballot if it were not for Jerry. My decision to run for a council was made a week before uh, we all had to submit our petitions to the town. And after meeting me, Jerry unselfishly secured me 100 signatures to add to my paperwork. He didn't even know me. Jerry and I may have had our differences on how to approach town problems, but he wanted me to run as a candidate, even though it was it was possible that I could have been elected and he may have not have been. And that selfish act alone shows you that he's not a man motivated by power and status, but he truly cares about the town. Jerry evokes the best out of others. Every weekend, um, I would campaign with him, and I saw him interact with countless neighbors and engage in a lot of caring conversations with people. It's a very calm and inclusive way in terms of his communication style. He's not boisterous, nor is he divisive. He instills confidence. He got me to get out of my comfort zone and knock on people's doors. So for a numbers guy like myself, who's buried in financial statements and prefers to be quiet, that's a pretty big accomplishment in and of itself for him to get me to do that. I know he walked 2,200 homes in Fountain Hills. I didn't do that, but he did it, and I can attest that he did it. Finally, what I want to uh, communicate to you is that he has a strong financial background. I met with Jerry three times privately to discuss the town's approved budget and CAFR. And oftentimes when I discuss complicated government financial matters with others, they, they just glaze over and get overwhelmed by the details. They're like, who is this guy? What is he talking about? Um, however, it's not the case with Jerry. Jerry quickly understood what I was communicating to him because he not under understood understands finance, but he also grasps accounting. So he, as an example, just so you know, as you, many of you are probably aware when you look at the financial statements, they don't always tie to the fund. So he caught on to that very quickly. He grasped that, and he understood that difference between accrual and modified accrual. Jerry Sharp. So simply stated, and to summarize, it's my opinion that Jerry would make an excellent addition to the council because of his unselfishness his measured and inclusive nature, and his knowledge of finance, budget, and accounting. Thank you for listening to my input. Good luck to all of you. Thank you, Marcus. Next. Lena Bellinger. 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 Bellinger.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm, I'm here for the very same reason. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. It's my understanding there is over a dozen talented, dedicated, and caring individuals who have decided to toss their hats into the ring vying for the vacated two-year two council seat. Two out of the list actually ran during the last election. My husband and I submitted a letter to each of you um, in support of candidate Jerry Friedel, so I won't uh, take the time to list all the qualifications as others before me have done. We were privileged to circulate petitions for him. Jerry and his lovely wife Barbara are a fabulous couple dedicated to Fountain Hills and its residents. Their good works help to make our community a better one. We also found him to be immensely intelligent, caring, and giving with a val valuable financial skill set, sorely needed. It is because of that specific set of skills that we highly support his appointment. Jerry's impress impressive financial expertise, knowledge, and integrity would do wonders to move our community forward while helping to solve the financial issues facing our town. Once again, I urge you to consider appointing Jerry to this vacancy. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. And the last one is Jerry Ferdell. Good evening, Mayor, Town, Town Council. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for your consideration for me for this appointed. Hold on a second. What is that? Is that an alarm? Oh. Thank you for your consideration. At least it's for, not your alarm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your consideration for me for this appointed seat. And also, I'm humbled through this process of running for the office. Uh, I met a lot of good residents in this town. Had a lot of nice people come up here and say nice things about me. And I just want to say thank you to them and to the great residents of this town. It was quite an experience walking the streets, meeting the people, hearing what they have to say. And I would look forward to representing them and representing this town and helping work with the town council. So, I, again, I just want to say thank you. All right. Thank you, Jerry. That's it? That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go on to our consent agenda. We have four items, and I'm looking for a motion to approve as listed. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay. Uh, I need roll call vote on that list. Mayor Cavanaugh? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. Council Member Leger? Aye. Council Member Tolis? Aye. Council Member DePorter? Aye. Okay, let's go on to our regular agenda. Our first item is consideration of renaming Plaza D on Avenue of the Fountains as Wally Nichols Plaza. Grady? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, um, Community Services Director will be giving a brief presentation on this, um, this item that is before you for consideration tonight. That I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Goodwin. Thank you. Um, good evening. I am here to talk about a potential renaming um, of one of the plazas along our Avenue of the Fountains. Um, so we're just going to do a, a quick little slide presentation so everyone knows where we're talking about. If you recall, um, a few uh, a couple months ago now, back in the early spring, uh, late winter, we talked about identifying six plazas along the Avenue of the Fountains. Um, so this is um, a view of the eastern, most eastern portion of the, of the avenue. Um, at that time, we did dedicate the most easternly located portion there uh, to former Mayor Sharon Morgan. So at that time, we identified five additional plazas. And since that time, we have been approached uh, to rename an additional plaza after former Mayor Wally Nichols. Um, as many of you know, um, he was our mayor from 2003 through 2008. But more than that, he was also a public servant in so many capacities, including um, participation in the Kiwanas, um, Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce, our theater, and he was also very integral in the establishment of our Boys and Girls Club here. So with that, um, in honor to his service and dedication to the town, um, in working with his family, we have identified um, 
Plaza D, which is essentially on the opposite end of the avenue. This is the portion that is western, out here just outside of the town hall. And the plaza in question is this one. Excuse me, these are the additional plazas that we've talked about here. But the one in question is Plaza D, outlined in red here. So the one right in the middle. This is just off of Town Hall. Um, this is also one of the plazas um, that does feature a fountain element. Um, and this is, the, this is the plaza that was chosen by his family for his dedication. So this is before you tonight for discussion and any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Uh, do you have speaker cards? I do. Okay. Uh, first is Jay Schlum. Good evening, Mayor and Council staff. Um, I'm just here to support the effort. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of former Mayor Wally Nichols, and I appreciate Henry giving me a heads up to this item coming to the agenda so that I could be here. Um, Wally, I, th I think we all think the world of Wally. And uh, this is going to be right outside Town Hall, just down the avenue a little bit. So it'll be a nice remembrance, and obviously the family's going to be around. So I think it's a proper dedication. It's not uh, certainly a huge one. I know you're going to name the fountain after me. I heard that rumor. <laughs> um, but, uh, boy, without Wally, we wouldn't be in this Town Hall. We'd be renting still over there at, uh, at the Medical Plaza. Uh, we, our financials would not be as in good a shape. Uh, he brought so much talent to this town when we needed it, along with the council members that served along with them and the staff. So uh, we've been blessed by Mayor Wally. Obviously, he came in through a recall election, which was probably no fun either. But uh, he faced the hard times and the great times with us and left us way better for it. So I support this, and I appreciate this, uh, this effort uh, for our town to recognize and remember our uh, one of our favorite mayors, Mayor Wally Nichols. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Jay. Rick Melendez. Good evening, Mayor Cavanaugh, Vice Mayor Brown, Council members mm -hmm. and staff. I'm giving you a few words uh, as a former council member of gratitude. I think, Mayor, what you have done behind the dais, and I sat behind the dais in the old building for years, and uh, it has been admirable. All of you who are here, dedicated servants, often you take shots in the paper and you, you get alarmed up by it, but overall, I think you've done a great job, Mayor and Council, and I'm on behalf of my family, I want to thank also former council member Cecil Yates for the years of work that he did in our community. Secondly, I'd like to compliment uh, the town manager, Grady Miller, for hiring Elizabeth Burke. Uh, Elizabeth and I go back to uh, Prescott, city of Prescott, where I used, she used to be the city clerk, and I used to testify in front of the City of Prescott Council. Uh, the last issue is very close to my heart. Uh, in 2001, I became a member of the city a town council. And every council meeting at the last, in the old building, the last row was a gentleman and a lady taking notes. And he came to every meeting with, with his wife and I finally got tired of seeing him back there, and I went over and I said, who are you? He said, my name is Wally Nichols, and I live four houses down the street from you. And that was the beginning of a uh, special friendship, Mayor. I uh, had the privilege of uh, working with uh, three mayors, uh, Mayor Sharon Morgan, Mayor uh, John Beidler, and then the last one, Wally Nichols. The, uh, family honored me by asking me to provide a eulogy at his celebration of life. You were there when, in a full uh, assembly. Uh, I believe this uh, agenda item should be approved, uh, not only because of he, he being a mayor, former mayor, but the type of individual he was. 
He came down to my home country of El Salvador twice and in the middle of the jungles, walked up and down the, uh, the trails and helping people. And so I'm in full support of it, Mayor, Council Members, and uh, I think we should all remember people while they're alive. I would always had an argument in society. We name battleships, we name buildings after the people are gone. And uh, so hopefully in the future, uh, the members of the council will remember people who are still here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is it? Okay. Uh, comments from council? Mayor, I, I do have a few comments. Um, and um, I also had the privilege and honor to serve with uh, Mayor Nichols. Um, I think um, the speakers have kind of highlighted some of the extraordinary characteristic of former Mayor Wally Nichols. Um, one thing that stands out for me, as was noted, he did kind of come onto council during a very tumultuous time in Fountain Hills in a recall election. That being said, uh, Mayor Nichols, or former Mayor Nichols, brought stability and civility to the town governance at a time when it was greatly needed. He championed long-term financial and strategic planning, which resulted in the strategic plan, which we uh, have adopted back in 2006 and continue to follow. Um, I remember him talking about the plan and saying, you know, how many plans in government sit on the shelf? And we talked about that. And he said, I have an idea. We need a commission to keep the process alive. And as we all well know, that commission is operational today and the process is alive. And it continues to be updated and um, revised. Um, another characteristic about Wally that I appreciated and I came to know him was what I like to refer to as a mayor that practiced high involvement governance. Wally uh, conducted the infamous Coffees with Wally at Town Hall monthly along with his wife, Sheila. And um, it, was just, it was just an awesome experience of, of, of government I I interfacing with, with residents. Um, internally, he, um, he championed staff development as a mayor based on his professional credentials he brought to the table coming out of a human factors background. Um, he led with integrity and um, respect for those that he encountered not only in town hall but throughout the town. Um, he was a, a, a difference maker. You know, we sit here and say, you know, we name, we honor, but I think it's important to, to, to note that former Mayor Nichols was a difference maker, uh, not, not to mention the positive impact he had in the many uh, service organizations that Rachel mentioned um, prior to being on council, during being on council, and when he left council. That being said, uh, it was an honor to serve with the former mayor, and I wholeheartedly support the uh, dedication of Plaza D in, 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 in Wally's honor. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mayor. Anyone else? No? Uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that anyone has said, and I, I didn't get to serve with Wally, but um, the first time I ever met him was when we opened the Boys and Girls Club. And I remember when we moved here, we had to go to Scottsdale for our kids to play basketball and to be a part of uh, some sort of sports. And, of course, they were over there with all Scottsdale kids and not kids from Fountain Hills. So um, it was just that that was my first encounter with him as a person who cared enough about the children to, um, to work so hard for, the, for a Boys and Girls Club to be here. And from that day, he continued to work hard, he and Sheila, to make sure that that Boys and Girls Club stayed here in town, was well-funded, and that it was available for all the kids, regardless of whether they could afford the membership or not. So that's my, that's my fondest memory of Wally with, with the children. And that's the, that's the one that, that is nearest and dearest to me. Um, Mayor, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that his lovely wife, Sheila, is here this evening. Um, if, I don't know if she'd like to comment or not, but she I is here. I see her. I see her son. That's his son here. Yes. Sheila, would you like to? We don't want to put you on the spot, but. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Would anyone else who's with you in your family like to say anything? No. Okay. All right. Then this is um, segue so on for this council to um, be happening at this time. So would anyone like to make a motion? Okay. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And no one's opposed. Congratulations, and um, thank you all for coming. We will be putting a plaque up with uh, Wally's name on it in that section, and uh, it's a beautiful section with a with a water feature, and um, it was a, it was a great choice for a spot. So thank you all for coming. Okay. Okay, so now I've got to move on to uh, appointing uh, someone to the Sis Sister Cities Advisory Commission. And uh, it's my pleasure to nominate Lisa Restuccio for the three-year term beginning September 18th, 2018 and ending on June 18th, 2021. And I need a second. Second. Okay. Uh, any council discussion? Any public comment? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Lisa cannot be here today, but um, <coughs> congratulations to her, and thank you so much for, for uh, giving us three, three years of volunteer time. We really appreciate it. Consideration of Resolution 2018-29, Improving an Intergovernment Agreement between Maricopa County and Town of Fountain Hills for exchange of services in the amount of $200,000 annually for five years for an aggregate amount not to exceed $1 million. Grady? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, the item before you is an intergovernmental agreement between the Town of Fountain Hills and Maricopa County. Um, this would basically be an exchange of services, um, not to exceed $200,000. The point of this is there may be occasions when, uh, through emergency needs, that the town may need to utilize some services that we can't mobilize very quickly. Maricopa County, as you're aware, is much larger, has a lot of rolling stock and, and staffing. Um, while I do think that um, there might be occasion we may help them, I think it's going to be the other way around. I think they're going to be a resource more for the town. But obviously, you know, intergovernmental agreements are, um, you know, two-way and never one-sided. Our public works director is here who can also speak a little bit to this and answer any questions you may have about this specifically. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. As part of an ongoing conversation that started approximately a year ago with Maricopa County Transportation Department while we were discussing the replacement of two cattle guards along the town's eastern border with the reservation, we discovered, um, the county and myself, that in the event that we actually had a situation where we would require one another's services, we did not have an agreement in place. Um, um, a counterpart of mine at the county took it to their board and their board agreed that it was beneficial and asked that staff bring it before the mayor and council um, for their approval um, of it also being beneficial and, and we believe that in the event that we need their help that they will be available and able to help us for some type of emergency event and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have Questions from council? Mayor, um, thank you. How, how does this process work? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a lot of money put aside. Obviously, it's, it's not spent unless there are circumstances that require that. But how, how, how does that all work? How, how does that relationship work? How do we determine what we should be doing versus what they should be doing? Is it a matter of manpower, skills? Help uh, me out with that. Madam Mayor and Council Member Leger. So, Basically, we have a couple of county roads that tie in to Fountain Hills from the east side and from the north side. Should there be an emergency that requires for one of those roads to be closed and the county is unable to do that in a safe manner, town staff would provide the necessary traffic control devices to close that as quickly as possible. We already as a town have some established cost for that type of activity and whenever it was completed, the town would invoice Maricopa County for those services. 
and the same applies in the opposite direction, the county also has established and adopted fees for services that primarily would relate to the closing of a road or helping a smaller community with something related to their pavement management or another type of situation. And those fees are already adopted. And so it would be, there would be a minimal amount of um, negotiations in regards to the scope of the type of work. But all of the fees primarily are adopted by both governments. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments, speaker cards? Nope, okay. Then I'm looking for a motion on this one. Move to approve. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Justin. <coughs> Discussion with possible direction staff regarding the Ashbrook and Cloudburst Wash floodplain delineation study. Grady? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, the item before you, um, we're going to have our town engineer give a brief um, uh, presentation, and then he'll be introducing um, the firm who is here to assist him with this study. With that, uh, Mr. Harrell. Thank you. Mayor, Council, um, the uh, Flood Control District and the town have been pursuing the uh, Ashbrook and Cloudburst Wash floodplain delineation study. Uh, here tonight is Felicia Terry from the Flood Control District and Ted Lehman from uh, their consultant, uh, um, J.E. Fuller and Associates. Um, let me give you a little background on this. The existing floodplain for Ashbrook Wash was originally delineated in 1995, and uh, Cloudburst Wash has never been delineated. Um, since the original study, uh, there have been a lot of changes in the, both in the uh, area and in uh, rainfall amounts. Um, so the 100-year flow rate has uh, greatly changed, and the channel can, uh, characteristics of Ashbrook Wash have changed. So due to those changes, the town submitted a redelineation application, which was approved by the Flood Control District in 2007. We've held off doing this until uh, we completed the... Uh, box culverts at uh, Saguaro and um, at uh, Bayfield on Ashbrook Wash, um, in also in conjunction with the Flood Control District. Um, for this study, the Flood Control District contracted with J.E. Fuller, and uh, Ted, Ted Lehman will now uh, discuss the specifics of this project. Thank you, Andy. Um, just so you prove that we actually did something, this is our draft report that's near finalization. We hope to finalize it here in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm a hydrologist with uh, J.E. Fuller Hydrology and Geomorphology. I used to work at the Flood Control District of Maricopa County, and I have almost 30 years of experience in the field. I call myself a hydrologist, um, but I'm registered as a civil engineer. So as Randy indicated, we're updating the floodplain delineation study, or FDS, for Ashbrook Wash, and we're performing a new study for Cloudburst Wash. The Ashbrook Wash extends from, and I'll show a map here in a second, from the town boundary on the east, adjacent to the fort, up to Golden Eagle Park Dam, which is just over around the corner. And then the Cloudburst Wash floodplain delineation study extends from the dam flood pool upstream to uh, internal to the Adiro Canyon development, and I'll show that in a second as well. The flow rates that Randy mentioned, the discharges for the 100-year flow, were changed for two primary reasons. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, uh, issued a new rainfall atlas in 2006 that updated the rainfall statistics for the whole western United States. The prior one was 1973. So there was a lot more information available for them to perform the statistical calculations to come up with the 1% chance rainfalls. There's also new development. We found portions of, in particular, on the Cloudburst Wash upstream of Golden Eagle Park Dam, there was development that just was not in place when they did the studies in the early 90s. Additionally, Golden Eagle Park Dam itself was modified around 2000. There was an additional outlet culvert built, which increased the flows in the downstream direction, but prevented overflows around the spillway and into the high school area. The dam was also raised about seven feet at that time. And so that increased the discharges downstream, uh, in particular for the reach between the dam and Legend Wash, which I'll show in a second. The new delineation on Cloudburst Wash 
it was not performed in 95 because at that time grading was still ongoing in the golf course development and it just seemed like it was, didn't make sense to do it when the ground was still changing. And then we updated the hydrology, as I said, to reflect both the new development upstream as well as the new rainfall statistics. So here's the study extents. So the Ashbrook wash here from the town boundary, as I mentioned, to Gold Eagle Park Dam. And then Cloudburst Wash, we divided into two segments, the portions between the Sunridge Canyon Dam and Golden Eagle Park Dam, and then upstream here to, Randy, what was the name of the street again? Stoneview Trail. Stoneview Trail. So that's the upstream limit of the new study. So here, as I mentioned, this is the, uh, low, this is the Ashbrook Wash. This reflects the new floodplain delineations. And you can see that the floodplain is largely contained within the drainage corridor that exists along the wash uh, currently. The uh, new culverts that Randy mentioned at Saguaro and Bayfield are in this area right here. And the new, the, even with the increased discharges, the new design allowed for the flows to go underneath the road. And so the, the flows in the flood and the floodplain are contained within that area. And then on cloudburst wash, uh, the lower cloudburst wash reflects the outflows from the dam plus a little bit of local drainage that comes in in between and again is largely contained within the golf course. There is one area down here where flows spill over into the lake that's there next to Golden Eagle Boulevard. And then I'd like to point out that we're also revising the inundation limits behind the dam to reflect the new conditions at the dam itself. Uh, I, did, I failed to mention we also had new topography flown in 2017, so all of the mapping that we're doing is based on very recent uh, mapping that was performed by Wilson and Company for the Flood Control District, specifically for this study and another study which we're kicking off, the Fountain Channel Floodplain Delineation Study, which we're starting this week. The upper part above the Sunridge Canyon Dam, again, the flood pool, so that uh, the 100 year flood pool is now delineated behind the dam so that nothing would be built below the 100 year flood pool behind the dam. And then the, uh, basically the riverine section of Cloudburst Wash. And again, it fits within the culverts that are in, already exist within the area. It goes beneath those culverts. And then the last thing I'd like to point out, there was a question that came up when we were talking before the meeting. Um, Golden Eagle Park Boulevard is above the flood limits of either the inundation behind the dam or the cloudburst wash itself. So all of the flows from cloudburst wash uh, either go underneath the culvert uh, under Golden Eagle Park or Golden Eagle Boulevard here on cloudburst wash, um, real near the tennis courts, or they squeak out through the lake and squeak into the, the wash next door, which Randy, I've forgotten the name of this one. Bristol. Bristol wash. So a, a, a few very minor flows squeak out and may end up going through the golf cart path around and back into Bristol Wash and back into the dam, but they all make it safely within either the golf course limits or the wash itself. And that's all I have. So, Mayor or Council, do you have any questions? Okay, questions from Council? Yes? It's yes, Councilman. Either yourself or, or our town engineer. It's my understanding that uh, FCMC is, is paying for the consultant study. Uh, that's correct. What, what, what is our cost? Randy? Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, um, there's no t cost to the town for the uh, study itself. Okay. Uh, we will be responsible to make the uh, payment to FEMA for the actual delineation. Uh, we've budgeted $10,000 for that. Uh, don't, uh, it should be less than that. Okay. Um, another cost to the town, um, we know that the uh, restroom control building at Golden Eagle Park um, the basement of that lies below the floodplain elevation. Uh, it was designed to be that way, uh, and, and that is an allowed use. Um, the storage and parking that we have in that is an allowed use for that. Uh, the town will be responsible to prepare an uh, um, elevation certificate for that building, showing that we're actually using it in a proper manner to, for building in the floodplain. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Do we Mayor, speak? I was oh. just going to say, Mayor and uh, Council, this item is really for no action. It's just a report. Mm -hmm. um, good news is if there was something that would have come out of this that we needed to do, there would have been some recommendations, and we probably would have had some uh, probably capital 
um, tied to this. Um, but at this point, this is unless council has any direction they wish to give to count, uh, the staff, this is really a report uh, for your purpose of reviewing. Mayor, I might add this, this also satisfies requirements from FEMA for a public presentation. Okay. Yeah, hey. one, one thing, um, Town Manager Miller, that did come out of the study is we actually identified some operation and maintenance things associated with a couple of uh, culverts and a retention basin that, that Randy had uh, taken care of and I don't think were recognized prior to doing the study that we did early in the year. So That's good. All right. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for Great. sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. All right. Anything else? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Now we go on to E. Uh, consideration of appointing Pierce Coleman to serve as a law firm and town attorney providing legal representation to the town of Fountain Hills and directing a town manager to execute a contract with the law firm in the amount not to exceed 180000 annually. Um, before I go to Grady, I just would like to say on behalf of the council, I'd like to thank Mitesh Patel for being our interim attorney. He has done an outstanding job. Um, we're very grateful for all the work that he's done in his firm. And also to extend a big thank you uh, for assisting our new attorney and coming in and bringing him up to speed on everything that you've been working on. And I know you're also finishing up some things for us that we asked you to start. Um, so thank you very much. We've enjoyed having you for our attorney. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. It's been our pleasure, and uh, we will assist in any manner uh, that we can to uh, make a smooth transition. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll start with Grady. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, as you recall, last uh, October there was a, a change with the um, town attorney and services provided by um, law firm. We brought on uh, Matesh and previous to him, uh, Freda, with the firm of Dickinson Wright. Um, we had a discussion in depth with the council at the council retreat to determine where we go um, with legal services back in February. And then we had, after having some further direction from council, we came back in May with um, a game plan for a request for proposal. The council looked at the scope of services and gave us direction to uh, go forward. That um, request for proposal hit the street at the end of May. The council um, had a council subcommittee um, that comprised of the mayor as the chair and also uh, vice mayor Dennis and also council member uh, Tallis. They met on uh, July 25th um, to review um, the uh, three proposals that came through. They determined to move forward with um, two uh, proposals from two different firms. And then two weeks ago, um, the full council interviewed um, the principals of those two firms. So before you tonight is um, having gone through that process um, that I just kind of uh, summarily um, uh, recounted for you and the public, um, is a proposal to um, execute, to direct the town manager to execute a contract with the law firm of Pierce Coleman. Um, in the amount of $180,000 annually and for that firm to uh, service our um, law firm and also our uh, town attorney. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Grady? Yes, that's a fixed cost. So it's $180,000 annually um, will be billed in monthly increments um, for this. It is also what's unique about this is um, it is a fixed price contract, so um, unlike what we've had in the past, this is a fixed price not to exceed and um, will be uh, reevaluated after 12 months, but this is um, a standard that this particular law firm has kind of uh, come up with um, as a retainer fee that covers generally just about everything you can possibly imagine that be covered with this retainer fee. Any other questions, comments? Do we have speaker cards? No? Okay. Then I'm looking for a motion. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We have nothing on number nine. Uh, summary. Anybody have anything for number 10? 
I think we have two events coming up, Oktoberfest and Make a Difference Day. Both are on the town Facebook page. I just have a report on mm -hmm. the monsoon season. And okay, and now we go to report by the town manager on the 2018 monsoon season and damage sustained by the town. Grady. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor and Council and the public who are here, um, obviously this past summer was probably one of the more active monsoon seasons we've had in a long time. It was a little interesting because in the past years, um, the monsoons um, typically would come from the south or from the east. Um, this year, it kind of resumed what we had years ago, which would have come from the Mogollon Rim and coming down southward. Um, that used to hit us uh, quite a bit years ago. We sustained about $80,000 in town property damage um, to um, a variety of parks, mostly uh, parks and right away with trees that were down. We also had some uh, canopies that were over playground equipment um, at Golden Eagle Park. Um, and essentially the good news is, is that we have uh, $5,000 deductibles. Um, so we're covered for up to 10, excuse me, we are covered for the 80,000, but our deductibles will be about 10,000. So we'll have about $70,000 covered by our insurer. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, also let you know is we also had uh, some of these storms produced water um, in areas that hadn't had that much rain in the past. And we had a number of residents that um, brought to our attention concerns about either mud coming into their homes or uh, water seeping into their, um, you know, past their driveways and into their homes as well. So um, we have assisted those residents. We forward those um, those claims onto our insurer as well, and, and the insurer um, is processing those as claims. Um, our, our review at this point is that um, there's nothing on the part of the town as it relates to our roads or drainage systems that um, failed or, or did not live up to expectations. But that is something that um, our insurer will be evaluating along with um, some of our drainage plans and our infrastructure to make sure that um, there was no failure there. Um, the one thing I did want to bring to your attention and I would like to kind of seek direction on is um, if you look in the packet, there's a huge uh, eucalyptus tree that fell. Um, it was one of three that we had on the avenue prior to that storm. And um, I, I'm frankly very concerned about the impact. Um, we were very lucky that that tree did not hit um, a building or a human or a vehicle. Um, because I assure you that if that had happened, we would have probably been facing, uh, you know, lawsuits and all sorts of other issues um, to get that resolved. Um, my recommendation to the council, I've been able to have staff go and, and take a look at what it would take to uh, remove those trees. And obviously it's something we can't do ourselves. But we did get a quote from a company that um, has a cooperative purchasing um, uh, agreement or contract and it would be about $13,000 to remove two trees. It, it's very expensive because, as you know, those are old trees. Um, they um, are actually um, very, they're, they're not native to Arizona, and as a result, they have shallow root systems. So when the trees like that fall, they not only um, damage uh, the area around them, but they also uproot the, um, the uh, you know possible sidewalk and also the irrigation system. So there's costs associated when these events happen. So I just want to get a read. I know um, there was also an arborist probably about five years ago that gave a report back to council and indicated that over time these trees were, were not healthy and would eventually have to be removed anyways. So what I'm suggesting is um, that um, unless there is a, an issue here, I'm gonna go ahead and work with the staff to go ahead and be proactive and get those removed. I think it was very obvious seeing the one that came down, what the force of that tree could have done and could have caused harm to individuals or property. So with that, I, I'd like to, one less to learn from this monsoon is we need to get these trees removed. What was the cost of this removal and after it fell? Was that, how much was that? Uh, Justin, did you have that one? I mean, the good news was, I mean, it fell, so we didn't have to pay for it to actually collapse, but there was costs associated with removing the, the trunk and. Madam Mayor, we do not, because town staff and the fire department actually removed the tree, we don't have an exact cost, but it was a few hundred dollars 
to dispose of the 6,000 pound root ball that we hauled to the landfill. There was also damage to the irrigation line that was there, there as well. There was, and, and, and again, those repairs were made in-house by staff, and so we did not calculate those, calculate those fees um, when providing sure. information to the town manager. I understand, okay, and, and is there plans to plant a couple of trees in those spots? Yes, the staff, I've, I've talked to the park supervisor and the community services director, and um, they have some ideas on trees that would be suitable um, either native indigenous trees to Arizona or trees that are um, deep rooted and would be attractive and fit in with the, um, the area. But as you've seen, the trees are now maturing. Um, so what we have, the smaller trees, and so we'll try to match those up, but we wanna go with a, a tree different than those because we found that those are also have uh, shallow root systems. Okay, so unless I hear any objection, we're going to direct well, to the town manager. Seems like it's obvious, and we'll move this. forward on this. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, last thing is I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you, everyone, for coming. We tried to take those trees.